Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Lord, pour out your power and love. As we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. You are holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Now, Father, we thank you for your word. We uh, just commit ourselves tonight to thee. Help us, Lord. We need your help in every situation of our lives. Guide us tonight through your word and give us direction for our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is after the Lord has resurrected and he has appeared to the apostles. And uh, in verse 44... Uh, we're going to begin reading in Luke 24, verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Let's just stop there. So this is, this is really significant. Um, in order to understand the Bible, to really understand it, God has to open our minds. It's not enough to just collect information about the Bible. We have to have uh, divine enlightenment. In other words, it requires God working in our hearts and minds to open the eyes of our understanding so that not only we see the words and understand the words, but there's a divine communication from God to us. And that's what we need. 
We all need to hear from God. So when you read your Bible, it's not just a matter of how much you read. It's not just a matter of where you're reading. It's really a, a matter of recognizing before God, God, this is your book, and I want to hear your voice. I don't want to just collect information and have an a intellectual understanding. I want to hear your voice to me. Now, in, in saying that, we're not talking about an audible voice, but we're talking about an enlightenment so that when I read the Scripture, there's an understanding that comes and maybe it applies directly to my life, and I see something I've never seen before about my life or about the world around me. I see something. Uh, just like if you're in a dark room and then someone switches the light switch on, and everything lightens up and you see the details. You were in the room and, and everything was present, but you couldn't see it. And so that's the way it is uh, in a figure, in, a, in a, a simple way, when God the Holy Spirit opens our understanding. That's exactly what the Lord did here for the apostles. He said to them in verse 44, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. So this is not new teaching. This is not new instruction. This is the Lord, uh, he, uh, for three and a half years, he had poured, poured his, his words, his very words, and, and his life and his words are inseparable. He said that my, uh, in John 6, my words are spirit and they are life. And he had poured his word and his life into them for three and a half years. But it's just like if, if you and I go to school, uh, we, the professor may do the best that they can uh, to fill our minds with uh, uh, what we need to understand, whatever lesson it is, whatever, uh, uh, if it's math or English, whatever it might be. But that doesn't mean that we're going to really understand it. We can hear what he said, but maybe we can't, particularly like in mathematics, I wasn't very good at it. It was difficult for me uh, to really understand how to take those numbers and to uh, make the equation work to get the correct answer. And so here the Lord Jesus, he's given them this understanding, but there's a key that's missing. There's a key that's missing. And now he's going to provide the key so that their minds and hearts will be opened in a divine way with a power that's heavenly. It's supernatural. If, 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 if we could only get a hold of this, the spiritual life is supernatural. The Christian life is supernatural. It's not about, you know, getting off drugs and, and coining a fornication and, 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 and being a nice guy. No, it's far, far beyond that. It's God himself getting a hold of my heart and my mind. And I sense his presence in my life. And I have no alternative but to turn to him, to see in, in Christ and his, his cross, the love of God when Jesus died for me. And that love takes a hold of my heart. And I surrender to him. And in that surrendering to him, uh, God is opening my ear to understand and opening the eyes of my understanding to see from his word, his truth, a revelation of himself. That's what the word of God is. It's a revelation of God to us. Oh, it's a revelation of ourselves from God too. We had no idea, had no idea how great sinners we were. But it's God shows us what we are so that we'll turn with all our hearts to Christ and in Christ find a revelation, the revelation of God himself. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He is the revelation of God in, hum in humanity. In a body of flesh, the Word became flesh. The Creator became man. And now he's, he's died upon the cross. He's conquered death and risen the third day, and now he's appearing uh, to his own disciples. And he's communicating to them. This is like uh, uh, three and a half years is coming to a, uh, a fulfillment in this moment. 
all that they've heard, things they couldn't remember, now he's going to open their understanding and he's going to show them in the Word of God, in the Word of God, the truth that they have really been missing, that they haven't been able to get a hold of. And so it says, he spake, uh, uh, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. So now he's talking about his death. He's talking about himself. He's talking about him coming into the world to do the will of God. And the will of God was that he would die upon the cross for sinners, that, that men and women might be redeemed, that you and I might be forgiven, and that God might be glorified through the person of the Lord Jesus, the only perfect man that ever lived here. He said, all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses. That's the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuter uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, first five books. And then he said, and in the prophets, so that's Jeremiah and Isaiah and Haggai, all the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. You see, that means he just covered the whole Old Testament. He said that the whole Old Testament is about him, about his coming into the world, about his death upon the cross, and he is opening their understanding so that they could see it. I may believe recently we looked at John chapter 3, and we saw that the Lord said, when just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And here we find out, we discover that he was talking about himself dying upon the cross. And th that was from the book of Moses, that Moses wrote. And now uh, in the Psalms, that's where he cried out in Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then in the prophets, it's uh, Isaiah 53, He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. You see, the whole Old Testament centers in the death of Christ, in His resurrection, and then His exaltation. See, He's the exalted man in heaven. And when we pray thy kingdom come, we're praying that the exalted man in heaven, the Lord Jesus, will come to earth and establish his kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. So this is an incredible moment for these uh, uh, men. There is going to be divine enlightenment. And when you get a hold of this, when I get a hold of this, that this is what we need. We need to have the light of truth turned on within our hearts so that we can see things uh, like they really are as God sees them. And what we'll see preeminently is Christ. Christ. Christ, the revealer of all that God is. How do I know that God is love? Because God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation or the sacrifice for our sins. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's the love of God. So it's at the cross through the person of the Lord Jesus I learned that God is love. But it's through the person of the Lord Jesus I also learned at his cross that God is light. Because when Jesus identified with me, when he took my sins upon himself, the wrath of God, the holy God of heaven, his wrath came upon Christ. And that's when he was forsaken for our sins when he bare in his own body my sins upon the tree. Praise, praise his name. And so now he's, he's showing these Jewish men who didn't have a handle on it. See, we hear this all the time and, 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 and we, we think, well, I know that. They didn't know it. They thought that the Lord Jesus was going to come and, and set up his kingdom right then. They thought that he was going to uh, throw off the Roman yoke of bondage you know, they were li living under Roman rule. That's what they were expecting. They weren't expecting him to die on a cross. They were not expecting his death. They weren't expecting him to rise again from the grave the third day. In fact, if you read earlier in the chapter, <laughs> that they were amazed to discover that he had risen, even though he had told them, because the light of the truth had not shown in their hearts. It requires divine enlightenment. It's not just a matter of trying hard to understand. You've got to get on your face and cry, Oh, God, have mercy. Open, the, open your book to me. Open your book. Open your word to me. 
that I might see great and marvelous things in your word. Hallelujah. This is so exciting. It's exciting because, you know, we've lived lives of sin. We've lived lives in this world. We have discovered, I hope, that this world has nothing, nothing of eternal value, nothing to offer us that's, that's lasting. There is no fulfillment in this world. No, there is no satisfaction in this world. This satisfaction is found only in Jesus Christ, only in God. And when we experience that, when we read, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. When we read that and God turns on the light and I say, I see that, oh Lord, you are the food for my soul. All these trinkets in this world, they can't satisfy my soul. Only you can satisfy my soul. And so that's what is happening here. Look what it says in verse 45. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. You see, everything that I was trying to communicate is in that verse. It's a miracle. It's divine enlightenment. He opened their minds to understand. Now remember, we all would like to uh, have things fast and easy. You know, uh, for dinner tonight, I, I put some food in the microwave and heated it up real fast. We, we, we want things to come to us easy and we want it to come fast. And it might seem with these apostles uh, that it's coming fast and easy, but no, no, this is three and a half years that they've been with the Lord. They gave up their businesses to follow him. They gave up everything to follow the Lord. It was a difficult three and a half years. It was a blessing, oh, beyond all blessings. But it was not easy because they were rejected. They were despised by the, 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 the leadership of Israel. No, this was not a cakewalk. And he had told them that in a future day, those that would persecute them, those that would even kill them, would think they were doing the will of God. And that is exactly what we see happens later on as we go through the book of Acts. These religious leaders thinking they were doing the will of God by trying to kill the apostles of the Lord Jesus. It requires divine enlightenment, but it requires the energies of a man to seek the Lord. You can't just, you know, uh, think in your mind, well, I believe in God. It's not enough to go to church on Sunday. God wants your life, your whole life, your whole heart. And when you give your whole life to him, when you surrender your whole heart to him, then the word of God begins to be open to you. Then your understanding begins to be open and you see things you never, ever, ever saw before. Things that can only come from heaven. Things that can only come when the Spirit of God brings enlightenment to your heart and to your mind. Otherwise, we sit in darkness. Truth is all around us, but we can't see it. And so he opened their understanding that they might understand what? The scriptures. To understand the scriptures, the word of God. You see, the Bible is all that we need in order to be real men in order to be men that are successful in this world. And I don't mean successful in the sense of having a big bank account. I mean successful in living a godly life, in being a good example to our, our families, to, to be a good father, to be a good husband, to be all the things that a man should be. It's in the scriptures. And yet those scriptures, we have to have the key. And the Lord Jesus opens he uses that key to give us knowledge and understanding, but we must seek Him. We must seek the Lord. And you need to be honest tonight. You haven't sought the Lord. You know you haven't. Oh, you played the little church game, the religious game, but to seek the Lord, 
to set aside your life and your time to really seek the Lord, to give up friends, uh, to uh, uh, turn away those, those influences in your life that you know are not good in order that you can concentrate and focus upon serving Christ, upon getting closer to Him. Be honest with yourself because God is there. He knows. So when you see Him, you will find Him. And when you find Him, He will begin to open your understanding to what? To the Word of God. And you know what? Not only will you see Jesus on every page of Scripture, but you'll see yourself. You'll see Jesus in all His glory, in all His goodness, in all His blessedness. And then you'll see yourself too, in all your failure, and all your sin. And you become amazed, more and more amazed, that God could love a sinful man like me a sinful man like you, you'll be overwhelmed by the grace of God. Hallelujah. So he goes on in verse 46, and he said unto them, thus it is written. Well, it's written where? In the Bible. Remember, he just talked to them about Moses. He talked about the prophets and the Psalms. He spoke of things concerning me. He's throughout the Old Testament. Even though his name Jesus isn't there, he is this, this incredible person of the Son of God who became man. And so he says, it is written that thus it behooved Christ to suffer. Oh, if we could just stop and think of that word suffer. You and I have no idea what the blessed Lord Jesus suffered. He suffered for sins. And to suffer for sins was far, far beyond the Romans and what they did to him when they scourged him and ripped the flesh off his back when they whipped him. Far, far, far more suffering than the physical side of the cross. But this was when the darkness came over that whole Jerusalem, came over where he was upon the cross, for three hours, the brightest time of the day from 12 to 3, a supernatural darkness signifying that God who is light and in whom is no darkness at all had forsaken the only perfect man that ever lived and the only explanation for him being forsaken is that he was forsaken for you and I because he became sin for us. Praise his name. He suffered. He suffered. The judgment of hell for a sinner like myself forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. The fires of eternal judgment and torment. He endured it all. He paid the price in full. In three hours, he suffered. And when God, the Holy Spirit, uses the key to open the word of God to you, you will read a word like, Christ suffered. And it will overwhelm your soul with what he has done in you for you what he has done upon the cross for you and for me praise his name it behooved christ to suffer and to rise hallelujah from the dead the third day you see he's the great victor the disciples looked at him dying upon the cross and they they were hopeless looking earlier in that chapter 24 the two that are on the road to Emmaus, their heads are down and, and, and uh, the, the, they're hopeless because they thought in their minds Jesus was the Messiah, but he died and so he can't be the Messiah. They had no understanding of his resurrection. And so the third day he rose again because he is the great victor. The grave couldn't hold him and death couldn't keep him. He rose from the grave. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, destroy this body and I will raise it again the third day. Hallelujah. So he rose from the grave. And you know what that says? That says that he rose from the grave. He died for me. And so that means that all of my sins, every single sin of my life is gone, is paid for. If there was a sin that I had committed that he didn't pay for, he'd still be in the grave. 
because he was on the cross for me. He had no sin of his own. So that sin must be paid for, must be atoned for. When he rose from the grave, that's God's testimony that everyone that believes in him is justified, is forgiven for every sin they've ever committed. Hallelujah. So he rose again the third day. But you see, God is love. And the message of what he did, he says, is to go out. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name in all nations. Repentance. My friend, if you've never repented of your sins, it's because you have uh, been hanging around in the darkness with men that think just like you and you think it's going to be okay. You'll be damned. You might be at church tonight or Bible study tonight, but you'll be damned eventually. Because there's nothing that you can do to save yourself, to wash away your guilt and sin. Only Jesus Christ and his blood shed on the cross of Calvary can remove guilt. Not church going. No, not at all. Christ did it all and he rose again the third day, hallelujah, and repentance, turn from your sin. If you're without Christ tonight, all you have to do is turn from your sin, tell God you're sorry for what you've done and the man you've become, and turn to Christ and see in him upon the cross the one that died in your place. And when you see it, it will be because God, the Holy Spirit, has enlightened you, has given you an understanding that you never had before. Why? Because you sought him because you're seeking him, because you want forgiveness, because you want eternal life. Turn to Christ. God's love is available for you, and the Lord Jesus said, I want that message of repentance and forgiveness of sins to go out to all the world. Hallelujah. It's still going out today. Praise the Lord. And then he said, and ye are witnesses of these things. Listen, None of us was around 2,000 years ago, but I can tell you one thing. I can tell you what Jesus has done in my life. I can be a witness and a testimony of how he transformed my life, a guilty, hell-deserving sinner. I can be a testimony and a witness of what he's done for me. Hallelujah. And I intend to do so by his grace until he comes to take me to the glory. My friend, if you want your life to amount to something, and more than something, if you want it to be fulfilled, a fulfilled life, a meaningful life, then you need to give your life to Christ, to follow Him so that you'll have a testimony of what God has done in your life. The high priest in the Old Testament, at the hem of his garment, he had pomegranates and golden bells. So whenever he walked, you heard the bell of testimony and then the pomegranates represent fruit. When you give your life to Christ, your life will be different. You'll have fruit for God. Your character will change. God will transform you. And then you'll have a testimony. There'll be a, a golden bell, gold for God's glory. will bring a testimony to others that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. And that he's the Lord of your life. We're out of time, my friend. You might be out of time, too. This might be your last opportunity. Repent, and in the name of Jesus, receive the forgiveness of your sins for his name's sake. Let's pray. A God would pray if any man's listening tonight, he's never given his life to you in this moment, that he might repent that he might truly come under conviction by the Holy Spirit, that you might turn that key, oh God, and that there might be light shine upon his soul, that he might understand that he is heading for hell, that he might turn to Christ and in that moment receive forgiveness in the name of Jesus. May it be so for any unsaved man listening tonight. And for those of us that are believers, may we seek thee, O God, May we seek thee as we should. For his name's sake we pray. Amen. Amen.